And here to take us through the auto industry as we find it today is Stephen Ratner. He is the chairman and CEO of Will Advisors, which invests the personal and philanthropic assets of Michael R. Bernberg. He is our founder and majority shareholder. Steve, thanks so much for being back with us. You know a little bit about cars, goodness knows, given your service in the Obama administration, putting the industry back together beforehand. Uh, is there a way out of this impasse right now? Because I sure don't see it. Look, it, it does certainly look tougher than I've ever seen in any of these contract negotiations. First of all, the UAW's demands are, even by the standard of opening demands, pretty extreme. Secondly, they're conducting this negotiation largely in public, which makes it harder for the union in particular to back off their positions if and when they need to. But all that said, there's never been a strike that I know of that hasn't gotten resolved one way or another, and it's not hard to see a resolution here, but uh, I think the mood is that it's going to take a good while. You have written in the New York Times that you certainly can understand why there needs to be more wages for auto workers. They've lagged behind for various reasons, inflation, but also the contract that they had. At the same time, it's about more than just money, is it not? Because the auto workers say, you're going to electric vehicles, which will require fewer of us. And the other side, the auto industry says, we have to go to electric vehicles or we're not going to be in business anymore. Look, the classic Harvard Business School case is that a company or an industry that tries to protect an, protect an old business model when there's a new one coming ends up failing. There's, if the Detroit companies want to be competitive, if we as a country want to have a viable domestic auto industry, we ha and, and by the way, it is the government's policy to encourage electric vehicles, then we have to welcome this change, and there will be displacements, and we have to deal with those. I guess I'm asking, how much of this do you think in the end is about money, uh, how much of a raise people get, because everyone agrees they're going to get a significant raise. And how much of it is more fundamental things about the way the companies actually run their businesses? I think it's mostly about money or money-related things. Uh, I think, yes, there's a lot of concern about the future number of jobs and so on and so forth. But I'm sympathetic to the union in the sense that if you look at the last 15 years, uh, auto workers as a whole in this country have basically stayed flat after inflation, whereas other workers have gotten some after inflation real income increases. And there are good reasons for good reasons. There are reasons for that, which is the fundamental competitiveness of the auto industry on a global scale. But nonetheless. Uh, in a world of 3.8% unemployment and one and a half jobs for every American, I can understand why these workers feel like it's time for them to get uh, a bigger share. Last week, President Biden weighed in on the issue, and at least to my hearing, weighed in pretty heavily on the UAW side, saying there had been record profits out of the car industries and there should be a record deal, I think he called it, basically. Is he making the situation better or worse? In the port situation, I don't recall him weighing in that heavily on the worker side. I, I think that's fair. Uh, I think we are closer to an election. I think we're talking about the Midwest, which are swing states. I don't think California is ever going to be a swing state. Uh, and I, and I, but I have to say, I don't think it's overly helpful uh, for him to put his finger on the scale. Uh, the, look, the politics are what they are, and I get that. But. But this is a tough situation, and I think there are equities on both sides. Whenever we have a, a very large conflict like this, in my experience at least, there are unintended consequences. There are the principal players and who does well and who doesn't, but there are people around the side. I can think of people like Tesla, uh, other automakers around the world, uh, certain states that are right-to-work states. What are the unintended consequences, you think, perhaps, of this dispute? Look, the unintended consequences are what happens to the number of jobs, not the price paid for each job. The yin and the yang of this, and it's a tough one, is that the more the auto workers get paid, and I'm in favor of them getting paid more, the fewer jobs they're going to be. That's just the inevitable result of this. If you look, for example, back uh, since 2009 at the number of jobs that have moved to Mexico, and the fact that there are now more auto jobs in Mexico than there are in the United States, it tells you something about how Capitalism and free enterprise works. It finds the lowest cost locale that can meet its needs. Are there potential consequences for the transition to EVs? I mean, I think most people think we're going to make the transition, but could it slow it down? I don't think on an overall basis it slows it down because there's so many players in the EV market. I think it affects who the winners and who the losers are. I think for the Detroit companies to be winners in EV, they, they need help from the unions. They need cooperation from the unions. And uh, we'll have to see how that unfolds. But if the unions make it tougher for them to produce EVs on some economically rational basis, then and the Detroit companies are going to end up being the losers in, in the EV race. Uh, in your piece in the New York Times, you point out the ratio of the CEO's payment to wages to, in fact, the average wage and how much it has gone up. I think it was something like from 
60 times to 400 times over the period of time, right? I think it was even 460 times, but it's something number times. like that, yes. Exactly, which raises a broader issue that goes beyond the auto companies. As you point out in the piece, it's not just the auto companies where that's true. And that is, in my mind at least, the question about how much goes to capital and how much goes to labor. There has been a shift, without a doubt, toward capital in recent decades. Well, there has been, but I think this is a question of how much CEOs should get paid. They're not necessarily the capitalists, they're employees, actually. And I think, uh, I think you can argue that the auto workers ought to get paid more because the CEOs are getting paid more. I think you could also make an argument the CEO should get paid less uh, because these numbers have become, have become crazy, uh, have become crazy. In 1979, I think I used in the piece, the CEO of General Motors made less than a million dollars a year, and now today we're in the 25 to 30 million dollar range. That is, that's a, a huge increase. And as you point out, that's happening all across the economy, and that's a whole other subject perhaps for another day. But CEO pay is a, and, and C-suite pay is a real issue. What does this say potentially to investors like you uh, making investments, not just in the auto industry, about whether you invest in the auto industry, but more broadly, if in fact there is a shift back toward labor that's got to squeeze margins, it's a practical matter, does that mean that the prospects for equities come down some? If all that happens, the answer is sure. I don't think we know yet. Yes, there are a lot of strikes and a lot of high, what look like big pay packages coming through. But you also have an economy on the other side where companies have more pricing power than they used to. Uh, there's less competition, frankly, less antitrust enforcement, fewer, uh, fewer unions in general, and so forth. And so profit margins, companies have stayed you know, surprisingly robust. Corporate, corporate profits are far higher right now than I think most people thought they would be at this point in a cycle. And so, yeah, uh, sure, the corporate profits could get squeezed a bit. Maybe they should get squeezed a bit. But I don't think that's, the, uh, that, uh, that's not what keeps me awake at night. <laughs> what does keep you awake at night? Well, if you want to talk about this area, I think, I think the whole future of manufacturing is a conversation to have. President Biden uh, has been clear, and so have a lot of other people, that they would like to see a manufacturing renaissance in this country. The IRA and some of the infrastructure bill and other things are heavily tilted toward making things here rather than elsewhere. But we have, have to recognize that we cannot produce most things on a globally competitive cost basis. We just have too high of a wage structure. We have too high of an overall cost structure. We have much uh, tougher environmental restrictions, which we should have, in my opinion, but which add to costs. We have permitting problems, which add to costs, and now those are unnecessary. And so uh, I, I expect that, uh, so people who basically say we're gonna have this big manufacturing renaissance, I think are kidding themselves and frankly, kidding the American people. Steve, it's always great to have you on. Thank you so much. That's Stephen Radner of Willett Advisors, and he is fortunately a regular contributor to Wall Street Week.